at the cross of our Lord <coughs> Jesus Christ. I believe.
do thank you so much for your love and your patience with us. Please, God, forgive us where we have sinned and fallen short of you, of what you would have us to do. We thank you for the cross. And God, when we sing hallelujah, praise the Lamb, there's nowhere else to turn but you. We thank you and we love you and always want to give you our best. Please, God, be with us now as we go into this service. In Jesus' name we pray it all. Amen. Wonderful that we can praise the Lamb. This world has gone crazy on us. There's so many times that it just wears us down, but we have a promise. We have a promise that at the end, there's going to be peace in that valley. If you guys know it and want to sing it with me, you go right ahead because my voice is going to need some help. <laughs> well, I'm tired and so weary, but I must go along till the Lord comes and calls me away oh yes well the morning is bright and the lamb is the light and the night night is black the seas, oh yes, there will be peace in the valley for me someday, there will be peace in the valley for me, oh Lord, I pray, there'll be no sadness sorrow, no trouble I'll see. There will be peace in the valley for me. Well, the bear will be gentle and the wolf will be tame and the lion will lay down with the lamb oh yes well the beast from the wild will be led by a child and i'll be changed changed from this creature that I am, oh yes, there will be peace in the valley for me someday, there will be peace in the valley for me, oh Lord, I pray, there'll be no sadness no sorrow, no trouble I'll see. There will be peace in the valley for me, for me. Thank you, Sister Laura. Uh, do me a favor, turn in your Bibles over to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're, we started this series last week called Inside Out, and it's a reminder to us that of who we are in Christ and who we are in our relationship with God, who we are in our relationship with each other, and who we are in relationship as the church body. 
It's a reminder that it's the power of the gospel living inside of us that gives us this indescribable joy, that gives us this ability to just have pure happiness and to be able to go out into this world and stand up and face everything that comes at our way. As Sister Laura mentioned, our world is in turmoil. Our world has a lot of things going on in it. But there will be peace, peace in the valley. You know, when we look in our world today, we see discouragement. We see disappointment in the things that are taking place. And if we're not careful, it's easy for us to get sucked into that. For us to take our eyes off the prize, to forget who we are and where we come from, and focus on the negativity that's surrounding us. And we can become so beaten down by it, and it's harder and harder to see the good things in life and to, rem- as a, and to remember who God is. When I first got up here, I said, hey, I took a trip that, you know, I, I'd never done before. And probably, I don't know if I'd be willing to do again. I said that to kind of set this up because we took a five-state trip to have lunch. We went to Memphis. My former youth drove up from Memphis, uh, from Georgetown to meet us in Memphis. And we drove down there and decided we're going to take a little scenic route. Went through Kentucky, Tennessee, had lunch, and then Christy said, let's go back a different route. I think she wanted to add a couple of more states to the trip. So we came back up through Arkansas and Missouri and back into Illinois. And as you're driving, you're seeing the different sceneries. You're seeing the trees. You're seeing the hills. You're seeing the rivers. You're seeing all this glory, gloriousness of God's creation. It's just a powerful reminder. And I love being on the open road. And taking the, that, that long trip to have lunch and back was actually pretty cool because we were able to witness and just be out in it. And as we came into Illinois... And I'm sure most of y'all, now from a, from a Texas standpoint, you remember I just got here in July. So from a Texas standpoint, this is kind of different for us. We topped over one of those hills coming from Missouri into Illinois, and it looked like there were mountains up ahead. But it was the clouds. You could see the cloud wall. And to me, as I'm thinking through this morning, I'm thinking through the power of God. And I'm thinking through how bright the light is when it's shining. Now, you could see the cloud wall, but you couldn't see what was in there. You could, it looked like a hazy mountain in front of you. You didn't know what the future held. But all around us, above us, around us, behind us, was all the brightness of the creation, the brightness of the sun. And it was a reminder to me that, hey, God is saying, I got you in this. You don't know what the future is going to hold, but I got you, and I'm there with you. And it's a reminder to me of how he loves me, about how he's there for me. And how I get to tell others the same feelings. I get to tell others how they can have that in their life. I had a friend of mine tell me one time a pretty powerful comment. It said, he said, it is so easy to give thanks when everything seems to be going good. But it is more important to give thanks in the midst of life's storms. It's very easy for us to be grateful and have a thankful heart when everything is going the way it should. But it's when we're in turmoil. It's when sin has creeped in. It's when the culture seems to be overtaking the church like we're seeing in the church of Corinth. It's when things like that are happening that it's a lot harder to be thankful because we see the negativity. We see what's going on, and we think, man, this has got to stop at some point, and it gets us beaten down and beaten down and beaten down. But that's when we need to be thankful the most. That's when we need to remember what God has done for us. The simple yet powerful comment is a reminder that we need to have the right kind of attitude when we approach the situations that we face in life. Now, as believers, as followers of Christ, we know that our hope is not found in the things of this world. We know that our hope is found in God the Father. We know that our hope and our salvation is through Him. We know what He has done for us by sending His Son to be on the cross for us. We know that Jesus was dead, buried, and risen. The fact that He sits at the right hand, we know this. And we have hope and we have trust in this. But sometimes our world can become so overshadowed by the negativity that we lose sight of that. As we dive into God's word this morning, we're going to be looking at how Paul is going to be addressing the church at Corinth. Now, if you remember from last week, we started in the first three verses of chapter 1. And it was Paul addressing the church, reminding them who they were as the church 
and talking about where he gets the authority to speak. The fact that his words that he's going to be speaking to these people are not coming from him, but coming from God himself. That God has sent him out with a message. It was a reminder to them that they are the church of God in Corinth. That it's not their church, it is God's church. And how they should be standing up against the culture, not letting the culture seep in. And all throughout this book, what we're going to see, this letter, all we're going to see is how there are so many issues that are going on inside the people of Corinth, inside their church. The culture has creeped in, sin has creeped in, and it is wreaking havoc inside their lives and inside the body of the church. The culture is starting to take over. And Paul has to address these issues, and he's going to, but before he does that, he does something that each and every one of us should do. He stops and he gives thanks. He stops and he thanks God for everything. He thanks God for who the people are. He thanks God for the situations that they're in. He thanks God for the way that he loves them and he takes care of them. How many times when we are faced with a situation do we stop and say thank you to God? Oftentimes we knee-jerk react. We think about the situation. We think about the stress we're in. We think about whatever is going on in front of us and not the overall scheme, the overall big picture. Last week, like I said, we looked at Paul's greeting. This week we're going to be talking about the ultimate authority and the happiness that comes from God. Now the people of Corinth, they knew this just like we know because they had studied his word. They knew the scriptures. And if you look through the passages of time throughout the Old Testament, throughout New Testament, what you see is you see that God is faithful in all that he does. Now, Paul has the confidence to be able to stop and be thankful for everything that's going on because he knows that God is faithful. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 19, it says, God is not a man that he might lie or a son of man that he might change his mind. Does he speak and not act or promise and not fulfill? Proverbs 35 says, every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Deuteronomy 32, 4 says, the rock, his work is perfect. All his ways are just. A faithful God without bias, he is righteous and he is true. Over in Psalm 18, 2, it says, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God, my rock, where I seek refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. See, God is always sovereign, and he is always trustworthy. He is our, our rock and our redeemer. See, that's what happens when you try to speak too fast. You put those two words together. He is our rock, and he's our redeemer. In fact, our faith as Christians is based on his unwavering faithfulness. And that is the main point that we're going to see in our passage today in chapter 1 of the book of Corinthians. Look with me, starting in verse 4. It says, I always thank my God for you because of the grace God, of God given to you in Christ Jesus. Okay, right off the start, we see that Paul has a very intimate, a very personal relationship with God the Father. He says, I thank my God. My God, the God who saved me, the God who rescued me, the God who redeemed me, the God who connected me for all of eternity. Remember, Paul used to be the biggest persecutor of Christians. And he was actually on his way to persecute more when he has an encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. And it changes his life forever. It transforms his heart. He knows what God has done for him. He knows the rescuing that has happened. He knows who he is now, and it's because of Christ. So he has that deep, personal relationship with God. I always thank my God for you because of the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus. You were enriched in him in every way, in all speech and all knowledge. In this way, the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will always strengthen you to the end so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Paul is thankful because God is faithful. Paul is thankful because God is faithful. Remember, not everything was going good in the city of Corinth. The people had forgotten their roots. They had forgotten who they were, and sin had wormed its way into their midst. And because of it, the church was being divided. And Paul is being sent to go speak into the hearts of the people. And he's going to do it. He's not going to shy away from anything that he sees going on. He is going to address it just the way his God has sent him to address it. But before he does it, he doesn't get sucked into the negativity. He doesn't get sucked into the culture. He doesn't forget who he is. In fact, he stops and he says, God, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to go and to speak. Thank you for the situations that we find ourselves in. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, work in people's lives. Thank you for the opportunity to speak into somebody's heart. Thank you for the way that you've loved these people through your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for all that you have done. He stops and he gives thanks because he knows it is by God's grace and God's grace alone that these people are saved. It's the same thing with us. It is not based on our works. It is based on his love, his grace that he has showered upon us that gives us salvation, gives us reconnection to the Father. Paul trusts that God will sustain those that he calls into relationship with himself through his son. Paul wants to address everything, and he's going to, but he makes it a point to show them something. I thank my God for you. I thank you. I thank God for what he's done. It gives him indescribable joy and it gives him confidence that is in salvation received through Christ. See, the church, we don't exist from anything other than love and the grace of God. It is because of the love and grace of God that we are a church family. It is because of the love and grace of God working in our lives that we are believers. It is nothing that we have ever done or can ever do. God is creating this. And he's doing it for a purpose. He's doing it for a reason. And that's to speak into the lives of the people at the time that he puts us where he puts us. He called the people of Corinth together to be a church family and planted them in the city of Corinth to speak into the people's hearts there. And he's going to give them all that they need all the gifts, all the knowledge that they need in order to be able to do so. And Paul was making sure that they understand they need to be thankful for that. There are four things in this chapter, in this passage, that Paul is going to give the people to help them have the same kind of confidence in order to shake the worldliness that's crept into their lives. And it helps them remember their identity in Christ. And the first one is because we have a Christ-centered life. Because we have a Christ-centered life. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 1, and you go all the way through verse 9, nine different times in those nine verses, Paul mentions the name of Christ as a reminder to us of the importance that Christ plays in the life of a disciple. Look back at those nine verses with me. It says, Paul, called by an apostle of Christ, Jesus, by God's will, and Sothenius, our brother, to the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called as saints with all those in every place who call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus. That you were enriched in him in every way in all speech and all knowledge. In this way the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you. So that you do not lack any spiritual gifts as you eagerly wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. You were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
See, Paul is saying that a life with Christ is everything. And we are nothing without him. We are nothing apart from him. He is the source of our happiness. He sustains us and gives us purpose. He provides us the assurance and the hope that we have, that we have a future with God for all of eternity. Because he is the source of our salvation. You see, regardless of what we may be facing today, we have a bright future filled with love and happiness because of Christ, because of what he has done for us. A Christ-centered life has no room for self-indulgence. A Christ-centered life has no room for self-indulgence. If you understand that everything that we are, everything that we have is because of God, if you understand that it's because of what Christ did on the cross for us to free us, to give us salvation, to connect us back with the Father, if you understand all of that, then it's easy to say everything that I have is because of God and there's nothing that I've done myself. There's no self-indulgence in I want this. No, I'm always pursuing Christ because he gave me everything. There's no self-boasting because everything is in God. A Christ-centered life is everything. and There's no room for self-indulgence, no room for self-boasting because it does not focus on worldly matters, but rather on those of eternal significance. And that's the prize, is the relationship with God. The second point is because we have a grace-enriched life. Because we have a grace-enriched life. See, we all start out broken. We all start out sinful, wandering around in the darkness, looking for something to give us significance, looking for someone to give us guidance. I hear the, the phrase often out there that I just want something to believe in. With everything going on in this world, everybody's saying this is true and this is true and that's not true and this is true and this is what I want to do. I want something that's true. I want something that I can sink my teeth into. I want something that I can count on. I want something that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt is significant. I want to know something is true. I want to be able to put my trust in something. I want to put my hope in something. And let me tell you, if you are there, there is no other place that you can put your trust or your hope like the trust and hope that you can put in God. He will never fail. He is always faithful, and he will never, ever forsaken you. And Paul is reminding the people of Corinth of this very fact of you are a child of God, and God has called you to be the church. And because of those two simple facts, you should be beaming with happiness, and there should be the shield around you that protects you from the culture. But you have to stop, and you have to acknowledge it, and you have to be grateful for it in order to fully understand what's going on. It's in God's grace and His alone that we have eternal inheritance as God's children. And that is something that can never be taken away from us. Through His grace, God provides us with certain gifts to be used for His glory and His glory alone. And Paul describes two of those gifts here in this passage, the gift of speech and of knowledge. The gifts of speech and of knowledge. Now as we go through the book of 1 Corinthians and we get over to like chapters 12, 13, 14, we're going to see more in depth about these things. But Paul reminds us here that these particular gifts come from God who blesses our lives with them and in order to fulfill the purposes he has for us. These two gifts were important to the people of uh, Corinth because they were living in a culture where people were coming with eloquent speech, with tons of knowledge of the world. And in order to communicate, they had to be able to communicate. So they had to be able to have the words. They had to have the knowledge inside of them in order to come out to the people. And so it was important for them to get speech and knowledge as two of the gifts. And it's by God's grace that he gave them to the church in order to be able to influence a city that was looking for the same. 
See, God calls us to where we need to be, and he equips us with what we need in order to minister and reach to the people that he has around us. He gives us life's experiences in order to reach. He gives us the blessings of life. He gives us gifts that we need in order to minister to his children. Everything we ever could could use to reach this world, we already have. And we already have the most important tool that we would ever need in order to change the culture around us. And it's right here. This is what we need. It tells us everything we need to know about God. It tells us everything we need to know about His nature, His character. It tells us everything about what He did for us. It tells us everything about what He's calling us to do. And it gives us the answers to a lot of the questions that the world is going to be asking us. It even says, you know, sometimes you just got to have faith. Sometimes you just got to trust. Proverbs chapter 3, put all your trust in the Lord. Paul is very intentional here in this passage about explaining that a grace-enriched life comes from having a faith in Christ Jesus and no one else. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 8, it says, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift, it's God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to God's word and for the glory of God alone. Jesus Christ is the Messiah who comes and saves sinners and placing our faith in him means turning away from depending on ourselves and becoming totally dependent on God. See, God gives the church the grace that we need. He gives us as as believers the grace we need and the gifts required to do his work in this world, which is to proclaim the gospel which is the good news of Jesus Christ. The third one, because we have a word-filled life. Because we have a word-filled life. Paul is reminding both them and us that as we meditate on God's word, as we spend time and let it fill our hearts, we are covered by his grace, and it's grace that we don't deserve. But we are freely given and equipped with the necessary tools to communicate the testimony of Christ that is found in these scriptures. Preached through the gospel, confirmed in our belief. In other words, God gets into the hearts of the people through our minds. He gives us everything that we need in order to study and learn about him. And it's through us learning it, And then taking that and putting it into our hearts, that God reaches down and says, hey, I love you, I'm here for you, and it helps us to understand that we need to put our trust and our faith in him and in him alone. Why? Because we read time and time again how he's faithful, how he's trustworthy, how he's reliable, and how he pursues his children. We cannot develop a love for something or someone that we don't spend time with. Oftentimes I hear people say, well, I just don't have time to sit and read through the scriptures. I don't have time to just sit and read through a couple of passages. Because if you even saw my schedule, you would understand. Because I am racing from the moment I get up to the moment I go to bed. I'm racing and racing and racing and racing and I do not have time to stop so how am I supposed to learn about God well let me ask you a question how many of y'all have ever watched a TV show yeah most TV shows are 20 minutes throw commercials in there now you're looking at 40 30 to 45 minutes 20 minute show can you do without one of them a day and spend time with God's word In 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, 
I always thank my God for you because of the grace of God given to you in Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in him in every way, in all speech, in all knowledge. In this way, the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you so that you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly await for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, and you were called by him into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That didn't take a full TV show. And then you stop and you say, God, thank you so much. What are you trying to tell me in this passage, God? Help me to understand what you're saying. Help me to be thankful for the things in my life. And God will will reveal to you what he wants you to see. And oftentimes it's, oh, well, if you go back a little bit more, I'll show you something else. We all have the time to read God's word. We all have the time to come together with our brothers and our sisters in times of fellowship, times of study, and times of worship. It's just oftentimes we think we don't. And because we put other things above God. We put other things above our time of fellowship. We put other things above our time of study. And this is exactly what the people of Corinth were doing. They were saying, yeah, but the culture is this, and, and I don't have time for that because I've got my schedule here, and I don't have time for this because i got this. And they were coming up with all kinds of excuses. And what happens? Culture takes over. And before you know it, you're so far removed from a relationship with God You're so far removed from a relationship with the church body that you look around and you go, where is everybody? Or you look around and you go, I'm hurting and I'm struggling and I don't know what to do because you're out there all alone. Why? Because you let culture pull you out. The people of Corinth are experiencing this. And Paul is going to be addressing that, but he's telling them that if you want to be sustained, if you want to be connected forever with God, if you want to grow in your relationship with Him, if you want to grow in your relationship with others, you have to spend time. You have to spend time. Things of this world, things of this earth are temporary. Our home is with the Father for all of eternity. John 15, starting in verse 1, it says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I in you. Remain in me and I in you. Just as the branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains on the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. My prayer is that we always remain a church that is so hungry for and longing for God's word. That's why we focus so much on what's called the triple D. The mission for us here, triple D helping others to discover who Christ is, to develop a relationship with Christ, and to deploy for Christ, the triple D. You see it in all all our uh, advertisements. You see it on social media. It's the triple D. It's the power of the gospel that enables that. It's the power of the gospel that is calling us together as a family. It's also why we make sure that there's scripture in everything we do. All of our worship services are scriptural based. All of our Bible studies, all of our times of fellowship. We're having a men's breakfast on May 20th. It is not a time just to come and eat biscuits and gravy, although that's going to be there, which is good. And, you know, bacon on top of all that. But it's not just a time to come do that. It's a time to study his word, to come for a devotion, to come for prayer time, to come to spend time together. It's important in order to invest. But it shouldn't just stop there. Each and every one of us should be spending time daily reading through God's Word. We should spend time daily.
daily, intentionally spending time with God, reading through his words, spending time in prayer, having conversations with others. The fourth one, because we have the promise of an eternal life. Because we have the promise of an eternal life. See, the grace that God so freely and reachfully gives us as his children through Christ's death and resurrection on the cross declares us to be made righteous in his eyes and to be ushered into God's presence for all of eternity. And as we wrap up this morning, I want to show you how John gives a glimpse of this in Revelation chapter 7, where he says, After this I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and along with the elders and the four living creatures, they fell face down before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. See, in this letter to the Corinthians, Paul knows the problems they're facing. And he knows that they've abused the gifts that God has so graciously bestowed upon them. But he is also confident that God is faithful. That God will sustain his people to the end. He knows that God always fulfills his promises and he never runs out nor fades away. In the Great Commission, we're told, go and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And at the very end of that, it says, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. See, God will never forsake us or leave us alone to battle against this world. He is there with us every step of the way because he loves us and he is always there. And I want to leave you with a question this morning that I want you to be thinking through. When you're faced with trials and temptations in your life, do you have the kind of confidence that Paul has that God's grace will sustain you and and be the source of your strength in the face of the battle? Let me read that again. When you are faced with trials and temptations in your life, do you personally have the kind of confidence that Paul has that God's grace will sustain you and the source of your strength, be the source of your strength in the face of the battle. If you are in a place where this is a question mark for you, where you can't honestly say yes, then I invite you here in a second to come kneel at the altar and say, God, take off of me those things that are holding me back from having that kind of confidence. Because if we don't have that kind of confidence, in our Father, if we don't have that kind of confidence that He's going to sustain us, that He is faithful with us, that is because the culture has seeped in. There is something in our lives that is pulling us back. And we have to be able to say, hey, I need to humbly come before God. I need to lay this at the feet of the cross. And I need my family around me to support me and to hold me accountable and to show me what God can do for me. But we have to be willing to do that. If you are in a place where you are struggling, I want to invite you to come and kneel at the altar as Danny comes up to lead us through our our final song. And and if you need prayer, I'm right down here in the front. I'll be glad to pray with you. Or to say, you know, you've got a question or whatever, say, hey, Pastor, I need just a few minutes. And I will be glad to have those moments with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the love and the grace that you so freely bestow upon us. God, in our lives, in our lives, we are wandering around in darkness. It's all around us. All we have to do is look, and we see discouragement. We see disappointment. We see anger. We see bitterness. We see hatred. God, we see all these things. But we know As believers, we know that you are there with us. We know that you are walking this journey with us. You are 
wrapping us with your love and your grace, and we are so grateful for that. God, help us to always remember to stop and say, God, thank you. Thank you that I get to go be in whatever situation it is. God, thank you for the trials in my life because it helps strengthen me in order to be able to be closer to you, to help remind me that I need to be dependent on you. God, if there's anybody in here this morning that lacks that kind of confidence, that is saying, you know what, I know God is there, but I'm struggling with this. Have them not wait another moment, but to say that, to say, hey, I, want, I need to place this at your feet, God. Help them to come down to the front if that's what they need and be able to, to pray at the altar and just, just to, it, in a form of submission, in a form of humble submission towards you. To just say, God, take this off of me. God, if there's anybody in here who doesn't have a relationship with you, God, I pray that they don't wait another moment, but they say, you know what? I need this. I want God in my life. I want to be transformed. I want to feel that kind of confidence, that kind of love and grace that can only come from you, God. God, we are so grateful for all the many things that you do in our lives. We are thankful for the love that you bestow upon us. And we are thankful that we get to be your vessels into a broken and hurting world. That we get to go tell others about you and what you've done for us. And God, we are so grateful for that. God, we love you. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. This is our time with God.